Confidence orale, the Honourable, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister from his ivory tower was insulted that the opposition did it work and asked uh, uh, and asked questions about defective bills and Canadians gave 60 percent of the seats here to the opposition. Mr. Speaker, there's something that's not right here. Two years ago, he said that Parliament should manage uh, the country and not necessarily the party in power. So if the Prime Minister wants to know why there's a problem with his legislative agenda, has he tried to take a look in his own mirror, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Parliamentary S to the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. All parties in this House made electoral commitments to adopt bills to strengthen our criminal justice system, and that's why we proposed before this House, I believe, eight bills to strengthen, to extend uh, criminal sentences, uh, to lengthen criminal sentences for serious crimes. We believe that all parties in the government should work with the government to respect their own uh, commitments made during the election campaign. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Secretary of the Prime Minister would urge his party to do a little governing. It would be good for this country. Yes. Conservatives want to stall their own criminal law legislation so they can blame the opposition. Exactly. The Liberal Party today, Mr. Speaker, engaged itself in this House to pack cis laws this afternoon, protect our children from sexual predators, control outrageous interest rates on payday loans, ban street racing, strengthen the criminal law DNA back, restrict conditional sentences, and update criminal procedure. Mr. Speaker, will the government agree to our plan and pass those bills this afternoon, or is this all about their crass political partners playing with the safety of our communities? Mr. Speaker, we would be delighted to pass all of those bills from in this place, forthwith, and in the Liberal-controlled Senate tonight, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. 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 regarding conditional sentencing was before the Justice Committee and the Liberals cooperated with the other soft on crime opposition parties to gut that bill, Mr. Speaker. I don't know what it is they don't understand about the desire of Canadians to get tough on violent crime. We want to act. We'll cooperate with any party to do it right here, right now, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Order the Honourable, the Leader of the Opposition. Hold them to that rhetoric, Mr. Speaker. And while we're talking about Conservative Senators in the other House, Conservative Senators, not Liberal Senators, have proposed 42 amendments oh. of their own oh. to their Accountability Act. Oh. Give us all a break, Mr. That Speaker. And while this is going on, Conservative Members of Parliament are filibustering oh. in the Industry Environment Committees of this House. Talk about frustrating the will of Parliament, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister drop his pre-electoral posturing and start acting like a party and a Prime Minister that acts for all Canadians? Right yeah. uh, the uh, Honourable the Parliament, order the Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, that is precisely what this government and this Prime Minister are doing. And Mr. Speaker, what Canadians demanded in the last election, and I know the Liberals still don't quite get this, they demanded accountability. They wanted a change of culture in Ottawa. And we brought that forward in the most dramatic series of reforms ever proposed in the Parliament of Canada in the Federal Accountability Act, which the Liberals have held up in the other place for over a hundred days, Mr. Speaker, and have now reported it back, sir, stripping out key provisions of that bill. I want to know when will the Liberals cooperate with Canadians to bring accountability to the government where they deliver corruption? The Honourable Member for Westmount, the Marine. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is showing himself to be very arrogant, threatening and controlling when he should be showing humility given his position. The population expresses its voice through the opposition as well as through the government. Has he forgotten this? 
Has he forgotten that almost two out of three Canadians rejected the Conservatives during the last election? And instead of complaining, as a child would, Mr. Speaker, can the Prime Minister set aside his rigidity and show some openness to ideas that are not necessarily his? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, Canadians elected a minority parliament, and this government is, is trying to ensure that, uh, that we have come up with an accountability act. We did a very serious study in a special committee. By the, we made amendments that were suggested by opposition parties that were accepted by this government. The problem is that the Liberal Party, particularly in the Senate, have, has refused to act on the, w the desires of Canadians. And Mr. Speaker, we are, ex are waiting for the Liberals to to wait for the Liberals to look at what Canadians want for change. The Honourable Member for West Mel the Melody, Mr. Speaker, listen and consult. Two words that are not part of the Conservative vocabulary. The environmental governments, the, the environmental groups, the provinces weren't uh, consulted about Kyoto. Women weren't consulted about the changes in the mandate for status of women. And once again, the Francophone and Acadian uh, communities were not consulted about the elimination of the court challenge program. Does the Prime Minister know that he doesn't have a monopoly on truth in this country? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, after 15 years of a cynical liberal government, the Liberal Party did not keep its promise, did promises, did not keep its commitments to Canadians. Right now, we have a government that is keeping its promises with Canadians, and one of these commitments was to reduce waste, Mr. Speaker. We, want, we were to say we would target uh, public funding, and that's exactly what we have done, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue along this path with tax reductions for families who work in Canada. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Marie. Mr. Speaker, the new directive of the Minister of Industry with the CRTC will come into effect on November 4th. This, he was pushed by the Minister of Industry, and, and this will. This, the sector of telecommunications will be hurt because the government is no longer involved. Why does he simply delegate this power? to the uh, Quebec government, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, to the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, th this government will continue to take action in a responsible manner in all industry sectors, including telecommunications, obviously. There has already been uh, a, a good uh, economic uh, uh, report card. We will continue to work with the telecommunications sector to ensure that all industry, including this one, will uh, be profitable. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Marie. That wasn't quite exactly the question I was asking you, but I would like to go back uh, to a document put out by the Minister in charge of telecommunications in Quebec at the time when the current uh, Federal Minister of Transport was uh, there. And the document says Quebec must be able to determine the rule, operating rules for uh, radio broadcasting, control development plans for telecommunication networks, decide on rates uh, for new uh, telecommunication services. Will the government uh, follow this uh, and delegate uh, competence and for telecommunication and radio broadcasting through uh, an administrative agreement, for example, the Honourable Minister of Transport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, I believe that the leader of the Bloc Québécois should uh, also add that a decision was made by the Supreme Court of Canada, the Guy Vermont decision, and this decision gave the federal government the power uh, to to take actions in the telecommunications sectors. If they want to go back to further old files, uh, what about when the member for Robeville took out all the rights of, from, uh, from workers when they didn't agree with the collective agreement? The Honourable Member for Montmagny, Lille, Comoroska, Mr. Speaker, let's go back uh, to 
the former Minister of Telecommunications of Quebec, the current uh, Minister of Transport, said in, in a document on telecommunications, and I quote, Quebec will have one organization, and we perhaps uh, he should give thought to this. The CRTC should re regulate communications as little as possible. The Minister of Transport, does he intend to put pressure to delegate to the government of Quebec regulation for telecommunications on Quebec territory? The Honourable Minister of uh, Canadian Heritage. CRTC has national, federal responsibilities. This government believes that we need a strong federal can Canada, and we will continue to work with Quebec in order to make sure that all the telecommunications and broadcasting services to all Canadians are what they want and what they need. Right on. The minister ignores the fact that control over telecommunication is a traditional request of the Quebec government regardless of allegiance. What is the Minister of Industry waiting for? Why doesn't he delegate this power to the government of Quebec, which will assume its responsibilities? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, as everyone knows, today's communications world is not only provincial, it's national, but it's international and it's global. And that's why we believe it's in the interest of Canada to have one unified voice for Canada with respect and acknowledging the special needs of every region and province in this country. Uh -huh. Honourable Member for Toronto, Danforth. The U.S. and NATO counterinsurgency operations in which we're now involved in Afghanistan have claimed the lives of 60 civilians this week. Since U.S. and NATO forces invaded five years ago, this marks the deadliest week for Afghan civilians. We also heard this week of reports of starving Afghan women and children, whole families. To the Prime Minister, with only one dollar going to aid for every nine dollars going to the combat effort, is it any wonder that civilian deaths and starvation are on the rise while security and stability are on the decline? The uh, Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I think it's regrettable that uh, the Leader of the NDP constantly diminishes the tremendous work being done by our aid workers in Afghanistan. He talks about one dollar, Mr. Speaker. The truth is this. A hundred million dollars a year is the contribution that this government is, ma is making right through to 2010. The single largest aid, develop aid contribution to a country in the world, Mr. Speaker, in our aid development history. And our aid workers are doing a, a good job and our, our military and, and diplomats are, are joining them in trying to bring stability to that region so that we can provide the kind of social and economic development that we all want to see in Afghanistan, which would not exist if we pulled our troops out, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Member for Toronto, Danforth. It's unfortunate we don't hear an acknowledgement of the civilian casualties, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, selon les responsables... According to the Afghan government, anti-insurrection operations under NATO have cost the lives of at least uh, 60 civilians. This is the bloodiest week for Afghanistan since the invasion began. This mission is not a well-balanced one. It's a bad mission for Canada. Why doesn't the Prime Minister realize that the mission is not working out well and that rather than improving, uh, the situation is just getting worse, particularly for civilians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, what is not balanced about this question is the position of the NDP because the NDP believes, Mr. Speaker, they talk about tragedies amongst uh, Afghanistan civilians as if, as if there's a moral equivalence between the Taliban and the democratic government of Afghanistan and the NATO forces that have a, a UN mandate. But we make a distinction here and we believe that the, that the international community must support the Afghan government to create a secure zone for this country. The Honourable Member for Mississauga, Brampton South. The President of the Treasury Board, with his Cabinet colleagues from Human Resources and Public Works, have been caught muzzling public officials and acting in contempt of Parliament. No. The Minister's no. answer to the Committee could only be described as evasive, argumentative, and imagine this, hotly partisan. 
That is why, Mr. Speaker, we invited Treasury Board Secretary officials to testify. We wanted to get their nonpartisan feedback on the cuts. Mr. Speaker, why were Treasury Board officials instructed not to speak before the committee? Is it because of fear that their answers might contradict their boss? Oh. The uh, Honorable the President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, I gave no such instructions to my Deputy Minister or officials. The Honourable Member for Mississauga, Brampton South. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Minister forgot to mention, yes, he was accompanied by his officials, but he forgot to mention that they were gagged. Um, when the President of the Treasury Board stated that the LRT funding for Ottawa didn't arrive on his desk until September 28th, Mr. Speaker, here are some of the facts. The LRT contract was signed September the 15th. The Memorandum of Understanding was signed over a year ago, and the Minister was aware of his Council's final vote on this issue in July. Does the Minister expect us to believe that he wasn't involved in this file when his Parliamentary Secretary requested funding details of this project eight days prior? The Honourable the President of the Treasury Board. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we deal with, uh, we deal with the issues based on the facts, Mr. Speaker. The facts were this issue came before Treasury Board on September the 28th. And we believed it was tremendously important that on one of the largest contributions, one of the largest grants, uh, given uh, this year across the country, Mr. Speaker, that we do something that was rather unusual, something that might be foreign to Liberal members opposite, Mr. Speaker. We did our homework. We did a thorough review of the case, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we were told uh, we were told then by numerous officials that a decision had to be made just a few short weeks before an election, and when it was discovered that we had more than enough time uh, to wait until after the election, we were very pleased to do that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bonavista, Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor. Mr. Speaker, the Treasury Board President's decision to meddle in municipal infrastructure matters during an election campaign is deeply troubling. He made unproven claims about the terms of a confidential contract. He claims there will be no costs associated with delaying funding until December 15th, even though he has been told otherwise to the tune of $65 million. Also, he leaked pages of this confidential contract to justify his decision to settle all political scores. Now, Mr. Speaker... Where is the accountability? What town or city is next on his political hit list? The Honourable the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, interesting uh, to see the uh, Liberal Party members opposite, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's very interesting to see the Liberal members opposite wanting to see government uh, veiled in a cloak of secrecy, Mr. Speaker. It reminds me of an editorial I read in uh, the Ottawa Citizen recently. And it says on Saturday, October the 14th, it turns out there are some people, the Liberals opposite, who favour secrecy, who are happy to keep the taxpayer in the dark. And not surprisingly, they belong to the Federal Liberal Party. Oh. The same party, when that was in power, was hardly famous for either openness or transparency, Mr. Oh. Speaker. Honourable Member for Bonavista, Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor. Mr. Speaker, there's this fish off the coast. And it's called it's called a blowfish. And whenever the blowfish gets in trouble, he puffs up, changes colors, and he pretends to be much larger than what he actually is. You see. Therefore, my question: Which cabinet colleague, which cabinet colleague, signed off on this decision? And when was that decision made? Now is the time to come clean. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, The Honourable the President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, when I was a, a young fellow growing up in Canada, uh, I would often go to visit my grandfather in the Maritimes. and they, We used to go uh, uh, digging for clams, and the clams like to be, Mr. Speaker, cold and in the dark, Mr. Speaker, and that's not how this government operates. What we decided to do, Mr. Here. Speaker, was to accept our responsibility. What we decided is to uh, accept our responsibilities and do our due diligence, Mr. Speaker. And I say to the member opposite that when it comes, when it comes to public transit and light rail in his own constituency, I promise the same accountability. The, uh, honorable, the honorable member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. Environmentalists, uh, businessmen, political sectors have denounced the abandonment of Kyoto by the federal government. Can the government not uh, take a second look at its, this decision, respect Quebec, and go back to the Kyoto objectives as the Quebec College is asking the Honourable Minister of the Environment? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree 
with a statement uh, made by the government of Quebec. However, they, this plan will do nothing to, tra to reduce uh, air pollution, so we have to have uh, a national framework uh, with uh, strict uh, regulations. We need uh, air quality reg legislation which will allow us to regulate in an integrated method air pollution and greenhouse gases. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. But Quebec is prepared to respect the objectives of Kyoto, unlike the federal government. It has a plan to do this. All that's missing are the $328 million promised by the federal government. What's happened to this amount promised to Quebec? This amount will now enable Quebec to reach its objectives. The commitment made, the, the minister should make a commitment to send this money to Quebec, the Honorable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I respect the Kyoto Protocol. I know that the Kyoto Protocol is important for Quebec. That is why, Mr. Speaker, I invited Minister Bichat to accompany me to the next uh, meeting uh, for the Kyoto Protocol in Kenya so that we can represent uh, Quebec interests and Canadian interests. We've had a conversation today and I hope he will agree to my invitation, the Honourable Member for Laval. Mr. Speaker, I would accuse the Minister of Health of being totally irresponsible with respect to women. He has just once again authorized uh, breast implants using silicon gel based on evaluations made by experts who are tied to companies that want to get their market share, nothing less than that. Can he name one expert who is not uh, somehow connected to the uh, companies that make these implants? His, his department was unable to do so. The Honorable <laughs> Minister of Health, Mr. Speaker, yesterday I said that uh, Many scientific experts with, have written uh, thousands of scientific uh, articles, more than 65,000 pages of scientific evidence. So if the honorable member wants to go through the documents, uh, she's free to do so. It's possible. Uh, I would encourage the honorable member to read the evidence uh, produced by these scientists. The honorable member for Laval, Mr. Speaker, he wasn't able to name one expert Health, uh, women's health is being threatened by this minister who was uh, duped by the breast implant lobby. Well, does the minister realize that he should take responsibility for what's going to happen to women 10, 15 years down the line if he bases himself on the opinions of scientific types who are tied to companies that uh, sell these uh, breast implants? The Honorable Minister of Health, Mr. Speaker, as I said yesterday, there are very strict conditions uh, for selling these breast implants and then of course uh, there are a lot there will be a lot of opportunities to study the situation there is already some scientific evidence uh, explaining the conditions uh, and it would be the it's a responsibility of the honorable member to uh, to bring their problems to the House if there are problems, but right now there aren't any. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the President of the Treasury Board said the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff Brody and Senior Advisor Bernie paid, quote, their own freight for a stealth trip to Washington they tried to hide. Mr. Speaker, not true. Today we learned these PMO hacks took a one-day, round-trip, private government jet joyride, every cent at the cost of Canadian taxpayers, and every cent outside the rules. Mr. Speaker, why did this minister mislead the House? Why did this government try to hide this meeting, and what other expenses are they trying to bury? The uh, Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's called leading with your chin. Because it turns out, Mr. Speaker, that that member took a trip with the minister to California last year for four days and didn't declare any hotel expenses. Oh! Uh, I don't know. Maybe he was staying at a homeless shelter, but Mr. Speaker, <laughs> all I can tell you is that the members of the PMO staff who had important meetings with the U.S. administration flew down on the Challenger and back, did not claim the cost of the Challenger, which was a long-standing practice of, of, of the previous government. And, Mr. Speaker, there was one, one meal picked up at the personal expense of the Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister. Oh, yeah. Honourable Member for Ajax Pickering. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, the member should be very careful with what he said. I reported every cent of that trip. And I'm going to tell you, this gets a lot worse. Treasury Board rules for Challenger aircraft state the government must report the dates and locations of the trip, the passengers and the purpose, and must be approved by the PM and the Defense Minister. This March trip violated every one of those rules to keep it secret. Further, a minister must be present on these flights, and there is no minister present on this PMO Whoa. joyride. He's Mr. Speaker, Canada. every rule was broken, nothing was reported. How can this House have any confidence when the minister misleads this House and the Prime Minister's office? The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, it was a, it, all of the rules were, were followed with respect to the trip of senior government personnel to meet their interlocutors in Washington to discuss critical bilateral issues, which in part, Mr. Speaker, helped to result in the return of nearly $5 billion back to the Canadian economy. But, Mr. Speaker, the member who just asked that question said he filed his returns. Funnily enough, I have it right in front of me, sir. I'd be happy to table it. It indicates he was there in California from the 16th to the 20th of January. Accommodation... Zero. Yeah. Honorable. The Honourable Member for Borassa. Mr. Speaker. Order the Honourable. The Honourable Member for Borassa has the floor now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After having found out yesterday that the Minister of Labour spent at least $70,000 for his tour of Quebec with his flight from Thunder Bay and his Tory blue backdrops that will only be used once, we found out today that working for the Minister is a darn good deal. The Minister authorized a contract of $24,075 to one firm, Normand Communication, a contract awarded between March 7 and 31, 2000. $24,000, $1,000 a day. Can the minister confirm that when we talk about uh, Normand Forêt Communication and his senior advisor, we're talking about the same person, the Honorable Minister of Labour? Mr. Speaker, that's the first thing I, first time I ever hear that. I will check and I will give the member a more specif specific answer at the earliest opportunity. The Honorable Member for Bouvetsa, when he looks at the uh, register of firms in Quebec and the address of his senior cabinet advisor, he will see that it's the same person. It seems to be a bonus before contracts even sign. We understand why it takes the minister a long time to file his expense claim. Why did he think it was a good idea to give his uh, advisor a contract before hiring? Could he tell us what Mr. Forêt did for 24 days at $1,000 a day? The Honorable Minister of Labor. Mr. Speaker. Is the minister, uh, member for Bouhassa telling me that the contract given to this gentleman was given to him before he was hired by my department? Oh, Nipissing Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, the constituents of Renfrew, Nipissing Pembroke do not want U.S. pedophiles freely walking Canadian streets. Yesterday, the Minister of Public Safety told this House that despite the weak liberal laws on the books, he is committed to using every legal instrument possible to have this individual detained and declared dangerous and inadmissible. Can the minister tell us, bring us up to date on what is being done so far to protect Canadian families? The Honourable, the Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Public uh, Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke for such an excellent question today. I can also say it's not only constituents in her riding, but ridings across Canada have those concerns. And I can tell the House today that CBSA has deemed this individual a risk and have detained him for removal, and he has the right to appeal that. Honourable Member for Halifax. The Defence Minister denied receiving a transition memo stating 1,200 personnel were available for missions other than Afghanistan, and the Chief of Defence Staff denied ever sending that memo. Yesterday they sang the same tune at the Foreign Affairs Committee, but I have that transition book addressed to the Minister, signed by General Hillier, and dated February 2006. Mr. Speaker, I can't actually believe I'm asking this question. But is the minister telling us he never read his ministerial transition book upon taking office? Honorable the Minister of National Defense. Mr. Speaker, I'll say this again. I have never seen the memo and I've never read the memo. But it's quite incidental. 
What this member is talking about is whether the Army has the ability to engage in a second large operation. I have been subject to many briefings from the day I joined the Department till now, and continuously I have been told the Army does not have the ability to send a large number of troops to any other uh, location. Honorable Member for Halifax. For denying things that actually happened is becoming this government's trademark. If the Minister didn't read his briefing book, does that mean he didn't read the memos on procurement, on national security policy, on NATO policy, on infrastructure and environmental issues? The list goes on. Mr. Speaker, if the Minister won't give straight answers on the simple matter of a transition book, how can Canadians trust him on the life and death decisions which put our soldiers' lives at risk each and every day? Honourable the Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, I've been extensively briefed on all the issues within the Defence Department. And if the Honourable Member wants to sit down uh, somewhere with me and contest who knows what in the Defence Department, I'm prepared to do that. Honourable Member for Outremont. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the former Government of Canada made a commitment as a partner in the Bombardier Series C for $350 million. Today, the spokesperson for the Ministry of Industry says this does no longer hold because Bombardier pulled the plug on the project. Nothing could be further from the truth. Series C is still under serious consideration by Bombardier management. Couldn't the Minister disavow his uh, spokesperson and confirm that the Government of Canada continues to support the Series C project and it will still provide the reserved money of $350 million. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for his question. In May 2005, it's true, the, the Government of Canada committed $350, $350 million to support the C-Series project. This support is conditional on Bombardier meeting certain conditions, including the formal launch of the C-Series program. As the C-Series program has not yet been launched, no funds have been dispersed to the company with respect to the C-Series project. Bombardier has yet to launch the C-Series project. When the company does so and when it fulfills its conditions, this government will honour its agreement. The Honourable Member for Outremont. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. M Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Parliamentary Secretary then, why did the Minister's uh, spokesperson say everything has to be reevaluated? Are the funds reserved or not? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Industry. What I can tell you for certain, uh, thank you very much for the question. The Minister's goal is for Canada's aerospace and defence industry to be positioned to be a world leader right. with fair opportunities to supply products, components and services. The Minister is carefully considering what direction Canada's new government can take to ensure that our aerospace and defence industry reaches its full potential. The Honourable Member for Honoré Mercier. Mr. Speaker, this morning Conservative members paralyzed the work of the Environment Committee. The Prime Minister is trying to act as if he ran a majority government. And when the opposition calls him to order, the members act like spoiled children. They sulk. When the Prime Minister was leader of the opposition, he said it's uh, the Parliament that runs the country, not just the party with the most seats. He used to have a minimum amount of judgment. Can the Chairman of the Committee assure us that we will have fair and justifiable work on this uh, Kyoto issue? Mr. Speaker, uh, the agenda of the Environment Committee was ground to a halt today due to Conservatives members filibustering the committee. This is shameful and unprecedented. Shameful. Clearly the Conservatives yeah. don't yeah. care about, about climate change and don't care about the environment. And, if they, and we as members of the committee are prepared to deal with the most important issue of climate change, the most important issue facing the environment at our committee. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Lord. The Honourable Member for Honoré Mercier. That's the first time I get a good answer to my question, Mr. Speaker. Their far-right party has just hit bottom. This morning, the Conservative members of the Environment Committee systematically blocked the work of the committee, disregarding the will of this House, disregarding democracy. It's petty, cheap, and immoral. After having abandoned Kyoto, after having ruined our international reputation, after showing that they don't care about future generations, the Prime Minister demonstrated today 
that he hates democracy just like he hates Kyoto. Why? Honorable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government tabled a bill that goes beyond Kyoto that addresses climate change and uh, atmospheric pollution jointly. Quebecers and Canadians want to know whether the opposition will agree to discuss this bill in committee. Honorable, the Honorable Member for Quebec. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health is endangering the health of women. Irresponsible persons caused the scandal of contaminated blood in the past. I'm asking him to name one single independent expert on which he based his decision. Let him name that expert. The Honorable Minister of Health. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can say the many studies have been conducted, for example, I can say. See, in collaboration uh, with uh, cancer care agencies in Ontario and Quebec, studied the incidence of cancer, uh, and that has been published in the International Journal of Cancer, and it shows that uh, women undergoing cosmetic breast augmentation do not appear to be at an increased long-term risk of developing cancer. I rest my case, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Quebec, Mr. Speaker, I'm asking the Minister to name a single independent expert on which he based his decision. He does. This is a matter of the health of the women of Canada, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Minister of Health. I have answered the question. I gave an example. If the Honourable Member disagrees with the, the example, she is entitled to do so, but the facts speak for themselves. The Honourable Member for West Nova. Mr. Speaker, last night the House of Commons unanimously passed a Liberal motion ordering Canada Post to restore traditional mail delivery to rural Canadians. Canadians across the country are watching the government carefully to see if the Minister keeps his word and respects this motion. This is a huge issue for our rural communities, and any further delay is completely unacceptable. It's been many, many months, Mr. Speaker. When can rural Canadians expect to see their mail service restored? The Honourable the Minister of Transport. I thank the Honourable colleague. Indeed, uh, there have been, as I've had the opportunity of mentioning, Many, many representations, not only from my colleagues in this uh, caucus, but also from members of the House. Last night we did support unanimously a private member's bill. And, uh, of course, in the coming weeks we will be able to scope out measures that the House will look at and hopefully will support so that we can get on and protect the... Uh, yes, unanimously, dear colleague, so that we can get on and protect traditional male rural delivery in Canada. Yeah. The Honourable Member for St. John's East. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on Monday evening, another foreign fishing vessel was caught misreporting its catch on the Grand Banks just outside Canada's 200-mile limit. It was clear, Mr. Speaker, uh, the vessel had over-reported its actual catch of shrimp in order to later catch an illegal amount of Gre Greenland halibut, a species under moratorium. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans tell the people of Newfoundland and Labrador and all Canadians what has happened since? Is that vessel still breaking the rules in Napa waters? Honourable the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Speaker, let me uh, thank my colleague for the question. Our fisheries officers boarded the Spanish uh, boat, found that the captain was misreporting catch. Our colleagues from the EU came on board, verified that. Spain immediately ordered the boat out of the NAFO zone. When the Liberals were in power, Mr. Speaker, our patrol boats didn't have any fuel. Relations were bad with the EU, and we had confrontation with Spain. What a difference, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo College. Mr. Speaker, one year ago, the NDP member from Timmins James Bay told of the horrors facing the people of Casachuan. He said, quote, the school is closed, the health center is closed, and a Health Canada official told the people that it was perfectly safe to bathe their children in E. coli contaminated water. Well, Mr. Speaker, one year later, the situation is not much better for the people of Casachuan. The school is still closed, the children are going to school in Timmins, not at home. Will this minister tell us what the plan is for the community in the coming year? 
the Honorable the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, a year ago, uh, all members of this House were definitely uh, concerned of the situation that was seen in Kasechewan. The people there faced uh, a harrowing experience, and Mr. Speaker, thankfully, uh, there has been some improvement since then. Uh, all residents have returned as of August of this year. Water now meets the Ontario standards. And, Mr. Speaker, our government continues to work with the leadership of Kasechewan, the Mishkigawak Tribal Council, to find a durable term solution for the challenges faced by the people of Kasechewan. Well, well, Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Collagen. Well, Mr. Speaker, where are the new homes? We are coming up to a critical time. The ice roads connecting the village to the rest of Ontario will be accessible to bring in building supplies. This government must commit now to a new community. People in Kasechewan deserve no less. Will this minister commit to a definite timeline? When will the last new home be built? And when will the last student be able to return home and receive schooling in their own community? The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. Mr. Speaker, uh, earlier this year we appointed uh, Alan Pope as our special federal representative who's working with the community, the provincial government, and all those affected to find a lasting solution. Mr. Speaker, uh, we look forward to working with the community to find options for relocation in the context of a plan to develop a sustainable long-term community. Good. Good. Honourable Member for Winnipeg South Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, despite, despite being on different sides of the conflict at Caledonia, the one thing that all the parties agree on is that the federal government has not done enough to resolve the situation. That's true. Mr. Speaker, Premier McGuinty said so. Carl Walsh of the Association of Provincial Officers and Ken Hewitt of the Caledonia Citizens Alliance said so. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Indian Affairs says that resolving land claims are a priority. Why then has the Minister been AWOL on resolving Caledonia? Is this how he solves priority issues? The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary the Minister of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. Mr. Speaker, our government has been at the table in Caledonia since the beginning. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to be working with all parties to find a peaceful solution. But it must be clear like that the government of Ontario did act unilaterally in purchasing the land uh, that is currently at that situation. Mr. Speaker, uh, of course, policing is uh, provincial jurisdiction on that land as well. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to be involved with all parties to find a lasting solution. The Honourable Member for Delta, Richmond, East. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transport uh, and the Minister responsible for Canada Post. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister provide this House with an update on the difficulties facing the international real mailers, an issue of much importance to many small businesses uh, from coast to coast? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the, honor of the Honourable Minister of Transport. Thanking the member for his most interesting question. Mr. Speaker, many members from all sides of this House have indicated support on this issue. Indeed, uh, the new government supports uh, small businesses and competitive economic conditions needed to ensure their survival. This is why we'll be coming forward in a, couple, in a few weeks with substantive steps to deal with the issue regarding international remailers. Thank you. Honourable Member for Malpet. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said the government put the Wheat Board under access to information, Mr. Speaker. Actually, the government was advised by their legal counsel not to include the Canadian Wheat Board because it's not a government agency. And the government did not. Access got squeezed in by NDP member for Winnipeg Centre during his con convenient love affair with the Conservatives. Is it the government's intent? to include all grain companies like Cargill, Agricor under access, or does the Prime Minister just want to give multinationals an advantage over the farm-owned uh, farmers' marketing institution? Right yeah. The Honourable the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. The government's not, uh, not involved in a financial way with Cargill, and Mr. Speaker, we don't force farmers to deal with Cargill if they don't want to. But since there's a monopoly situation on the prairies and uh, only Western Canadian producers have to deal with the Canadian Wheat Board. Since there's government money involved, Mr. Speaker, farmers should have access to information 
access to that, that uh, corporation so that they can find out where their money is being spent. The Honourable Member for L'Honourable Député de Laval. The Honourable Member for Laval, Mr. Speaker. Will the Minister admit that the study he just mentioned to make his decision to authorize breast implants does not deal with ruptured implants or the diseases caused by ruptured implants, and therefore it is incomplete does not provide the Minister the data essential to make this decision. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, there are many examples. Another example is a second study that examines mortality rates published by the American Journal of Epidemiology and that found that breast implants do not increase mortality rates among women. There are many such studies, Mr. Speaker. Those are two that I've cited. Okay, I've got to end this. Sorry. Let's go. The, I'd like to draw to the attention of honorable members the presence in the gallery of the winner of the 2006 Sadie Bronfman Award for Excellence in the Fine Arts, Mr. Peter Pounding, and past award recipients Michael Hasseluk, Kai Chai Chan, Maurice Savoy, Susan Warner Keen, Carol Saviston, Michael Wilcox, Micheline Beauchemin, Lois Etherington Betteridge, Robin Hopper, and Marcel Marois. Stan is rising on what? Ah, well, we'll have the Thursday question first. The Honourable Member for Wascana. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as is the tradition on this day, I wonder if, uh, if the uh, Government House Leader could give us uh, an indication of uh, his plan for uh, government business between now uh, and the time when the, uh, when the House will uh, uh, take a recess at uh, uh, the time of Remembrance Day. Uh, and I wonder, uh, in his report, if he uh, is now in a position to specify the two dates uh, upon which uh, the House will, uh, uh, on certain evenings, consider uh, the estimates in the Committee of the Whole of uh, two uh, government departments. Uh, those departments have already been indicated as...